Well, thanks very much uh, for inviting me along to speak, Simon, and thanks for everyone to kind of turning up and listening to me drone on. And uh, thanks also to uh, DLA Piper for hosting uh, the event offices. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about the current internet arch uh, infrastructure. Um, so Simon was saying the centralised uh, infrastructure. Um, and really looking into the stuff that powers all the apps and uh, devices that we've become so used to using and how they affect and govern the relationship with our own data and the companies that provide services. I'm going to look at some of the problems with um, internet architecture as well. Hopefully it's not as boring as it sounds. Um, and uh, highlight some different approaches that both the company I work for, MadeSafe, and others are taking. So I hope you enjoy the talk. So in uh, late October, um, just a month ago, um, several of the sites here, uh, The Guardian, CNN, Netflix, Spotify and others, um, went offline. And the reason that they went offline was not a problem with the sites themselves. Um, what happened was there was a, a, a botnet, which is a, a networked um, amount of devices that were controlled by um, uh, um, a piece of malicious software that effectively attacked um, a company called DIN. So what they did was a distributed denial of service attack, which is a lot of words, a DDoS attack. So what they effectively did is uh, go after the servers and make so many requests in those servers that they're unable to process the data and they literally collapse under the amount of requests, meaning that they're uh, unable to serve legitimate requests for data. Um, now this was um, relevant to, and the reason I bring this up and it's relevant to this group, is this attack was bringing together 100,000 IoT devices. So these were digital video recorders and mostly digital cameras that were uh, affected with this Mariah botnet. These 100,000 devices made all these requests onto a company called DIN. Now DIN is a New Hampshire based DNS provider. So DNS is domain name service and they effectively route all our traffic to the correct points. So if you type in spotify.com, companies like DIN make sure that you get routed to that specific page. So when this company then was attacked and, and targeted, all of these sites were taken down as a result. And this is partly because of the fact that data right now is centralised on data centres and servers. Now data is also inherently insecure uh, and it doesn't need me to tell you that. Um, I think we're almost desensitised the amount of attacks and stuff that we see uh, today. Um, I think uh, people like Sony Pictures is one, Talk Talk internet service provider, um, Target, Tesco was recently hit as well. Um, and these attacks are very, very expensive. Um, and there's a lot of uh, data being stolen. So about 3.6 billion uh, records have been stolen uh, from January 2013 to January this year. Um, now those records can be anything from passwords, user IDs, credit cards, um, or if you're a a celebrity, your iCloud account gets hacked on a daily basis and your, your picture's put online. So everything's getting stolen um, and they're expensive. Um, IBM um, think that these, these hacks cost about $154 per record for the companies that are targeted. And that information, those costs are coming from uh, losing customers and making it harder for those companies to um, acquire new customers. Now, if you do simple maths of multiplying the number of stolen records by that cost. You've got a bill of over half a trillion dollars in the last three years, so it's a significant problem. Um, and we really don't have a solution for it at the moment. Um, we're trying to apply, in my opinion, at least kind of patchwork, uh, trying to put plasters over this problem. But fundamentally, the networks that we're using are, are not secure. Um, and this is also affecting consumer confidence as well. So you can see from this chart here, and this was a large study taken about a year ago in Europe and it's about 24,000 respondents and 50% of those cite becoming a victim of fraud as their biggest concern and 44% um, online data being used for fraudulent purposes. I would suspect if you did that same survey again you would probably see the numbers are even higher than that. Now this is not only, um, data breaches don't only happen to large businesses. Um, although they are the ones that make the headlines. Um, we're seeing about in the UK about 74% of SMEs um, are reporting a breach every year. So it's really affecting us all. And just when I'm, I've not beaten data centres down quite enough, are there other problems with them as well? Um, 
in my view, they're extremely expensive. So Google has about 15 data centers worldwide, and when they were built, they each cost about a billion dollars to build. Um, so if you look back to 2007, Google, Google's a public company, so a lot of their, this information is available online. Um, so back in 2007, uh, their bill for data centers was about uh, $2.4 billion, which is a pretty hefty bill already. Fast forward to 2015, and that bill had risen to $11 billion. And if you then add on the first quarter of 2016, you get five quarters costing $13 billion, so extremely expensive. And interestingly, data centers actually use 3% of the entire world's electricity, uh, so it's um, a real drain in our resources. And even small uh, data centers are expensive. By small, I could mean something like 50 to 400 servers. Excluding the construction of that building, just the, 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 the acquisition of the, 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 uh, the racks and the servers, etc., would cost about 600000 to a million dollars a year to put together and maintain. So extremely expensive. So Houston, we have a problem. Um, so centralized services are obviously very vulnerable to attack. And these problems are only set to continue. So if you look at um, IoT again and the number of connected devices, so Gartner tells us that we're going to have about 6.5 billion uh, connected devices by the end of this year. Um, I don't know how we check that, but that's what they tell us. Um, now, by the end of 2020, we're looking at about 21 billion devices. So this problem is not going away. Um, and I think one of the major issues I personally have is that we don't control any of this data. So Simon was kind of talking about it at the start as well. It's, in many cases, this data, is, we see it as ours, and it is ours because we produce the content. But the, the gatekeepers allow us to access it. So at any time your, your access to your data, whether it's in Dropbox or Google or whatever, can be revoked. I don't know if any of you guys saw in the, in the news, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, his Facebook account was deleted. Um, and obviously that was a, a mistake. And I'm not saying that goes on all the time, but it's something that, that you, do, you don't have that power as users. And it's that old cliche, you're not a user of that, that um, service, you're the product itself. And these companies make money by selling your data and access to you to advertisers. And finally, also, IoT devices are insecure. As the attack I talked about at the start with DIN, um, I think a lot of energy has gone into connecting these devices and making them do really clever things. I was surprised to learn that the guy, Paul Brody, who's going to speak later, um, has been involved in a project called Adept, and some of the stuff he'll talk about is really, really incredible. Um, but I don't know that much thought has been given to the actual the security of those devices. So these are issues as well. Again, as Simon was talking about, there's, this is a simplified model, of course, because the internet's a bit more complex than this, but just, um, just so everyone understands what I'm, I'm meaning by centralized. As we can see here on the left, um, a, a representation of the existing internet where multiple nodes access single servers, um, single points of failure, um, as we've seen. And then uh, lots of different uh, decentralized models. There's distributed, there's decentralized, there's, there's uh, hybrid models as well. The one I've focused on here is uh, the company I work for, MadeSafe, is building something called the SAFE network, which I'll look at. And this is a classic peer-to-peer -peer model. So these are all of these nodes or devices or computers on the network are all have equal authority in the network and there's no central point of control. So that's what we're talking about when we mean uh, decentralization. And I mean, this paradigm is certainly not made safe. This is the decentralization is um, probably the most logical, I would say, model. And something that actually is, n we're not reinventing anything here. It's, it's actually going back to the way the internet was. Um, so in the late, uh, early 70s, I think, ARPANET, which was one of the kind of an earlier version of the internet, if you like, was decentralized. And, um, and just as it became more commercial, it became centralized. So what we're really doing here is going back to the roots, I would say, of the internet. Um, you've got other things like BitTorrent, which is a decentralized technology as well. I'm sure many in the room have heard of BitTorrent or even use it to pirate movies, although you might not admit it. Um, and that's really, really well used. So you've got about 15 to 30 million concurrent users and about 300 million people a month use that service. So decentralized technology has been around a long time and it is well in use. So as I say, um, MadeSafe is a company based in Sunny Troon. Um, and we are building the Secure Access for Everyone or SAFE network. 
Um, and what we are doing is we are, we are removing data centers and servers from the management of our data and replacing them with the spare computing resources of all the users on the network. Now, people often ask, is there enough space that we have to store all of our data? There's lots of it. But if you look, they reckon there's about a billion connected devices. And by devices, I mean uh, laptops and desktops. And if we assume probably quite prudently that there's about 50 gig of available storage on each of those devices. Now, I've got a laptop. I probably have a few hundred gig free on it. And if we all gave those into this network, you would have about 500,000 petabytes of data. Um, now, that's a hard number to get your head around. A petabyte is a million gigabytes. And a, an HD film is about a gig. So, so that is an awful lot of information. To put this in context, Google, um, in, I think it was about four years ago, they were thought to have about um, 8,000 petabytes of data to serve YouTube, Mail, and all the applications that they have. A bit way more than that now, for sure. But just to show, 500,000 petabytes is an awful lot. So on this network that we are building, we are building this infrastructure. The intention is that this will replace all web services. And so we will build like almost like the, the train tracks, if you will, and we'll have application developers hopefully building applications on top that end users will use. So this is a, da a, a data and communications network. So we'll be able to put things like YouTube, Dropbox, any type of app that, that you can build today. Um, and at the moment, what's possible in this network, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about where we are right now, but it's possible to store data, um, host websites, um, email, do um, uh, Skype-type chats through WebRTC. So this stuff is available today, although be it in, in fairly early form, I must say. Um, so as people are storing data on this network, it's always encrypted. So a big thing that MadeSafe are focused on is security and privacy. So there's lots of decentralized networks out there. It's bewildering to know how they're all different from one another. Um, you get things like IPFS, you'll hear Ethereum and, and others. And sometimes it's very difficult to tell, tell them apart because even the language that they use is very confusing. Um, I mean, I go into some of the sites, sometimes even look at our own stuff and I think, I don't even know what we mean with that. So it's very difficult because they're almost coming up with the language on the fly. Um, but on, on the SAFE network, at least, whenever data is uploaded or saved onto the network, it is automatically broken down into chunks, randomized and encrypted and stored on all the different computers across the network. Um, so uh, security is a real uh, focus and only the connect correct credentials can reconstitute those files and bring them back. Now, each node in the network, so that could be a computer at home. Uh, for you guys, so you could just download our software and contribute to this network. And your computer at home would perform multiple different functions on the network, sometimes at the same time. So you could maybe store data at home, you could route traffic to a piece of data, you could decide whether someone else has access to a piece of data. And you don't ever do this, your, your node doesn't have the ability to do this alone. It forms consensus with lots of other nodes that make decisions. And the reason that we need to do that is because there's no centralized point of control. So we're, we're looking for all of your computers to use the algorithms of the network to make decisions. Um, so. And we don't ask that people leave their resources for free on the network. So the network will pay you. Um, so this is not something that's enabled yet, but there's a, a cryptocurrency on the network uh, called Safecoin, um, which is kind of akin to Bitcoin in some respects. So it's like digital money, for those of you not familiar with it. And this is a proxy of Safecoin is available today and traded on exchanges right now. So it's worth about, they're worth about seven cents each. And there's about $200,000 a day is traded of these coins. And we've not launched the network yet. Um, so as you store, as store um, data for other people and that data is retrieved from your computer at home that's potentially doing nothing, sitting in a corner, all you need to do is turn it on. Um, you would be paid by the network, not by the company MadeSafe, but by the network, these safe coins. And as users, you could then take those safe coins and either use them for other services on the network or take them to an online exchange and convert them into cash. So you could actually have the untapped resource you have at home earning money for you. Now, with MadeSafe, there is no blockchain. Um, 
throw, which is an interesting. Uh, and obviously, it's this public uh, append-only uh, ledger that really keeps track of and keeps everyone honest on the network. And this is also uh, used uh, for consensus as well. Uh, now, MadeSafe don't have a blockchain, so we actually don't have, we don't know all the owners of a coin. Um, all we have is the current owner and the previous owner of a coin. So you should think of it in some way as digital cash. So if you went to a news agent and bought a paper, all you could really say, the news agent could say, well, you paid me that, so I knew you were the, the previous owner and I'm now the current owner. And in doing that, not having this blockchain it's not suitable for, for every type of, of uh, use case. So if you're a bank, that's not a particularly suitable way of, of running things. You would want this ledger. But for people serving data, it, it removes all these scaling issues that you get with Bitcoin. And you could also imagine that these uh, computers I'm talking about at home, these could also be IoT devices. So we could start to have smart homes. And I'm thinking way into the future here. This is not something that's going to happen tomorrow. Um, but you could have um, all these devices um, basically connected by the safe network. And I think actually as we move forward, what we'll see is we'll see lots and lots of different types of networks for different functions. You'll have blockchains for financial uh, networks, maybe things like the safe network for data and, and lots of other IPFS for, for data availability and things like that. Now, in terms of where we are right now, um, I often get excited and talk about this as if it exists today and people always kind of say, well, it's not, and a lot of it's theory, and that is correct to say that. So what we have today is um, a few hundred nodes running in a data center, ironically enough. Um, and the reason we're running a data center is because we need these nodes to be online and of a, of a reasonable spec. So we have enabled users to run their computers from home, but what we found was um, typically the nodes were not um, fast enough to maintain the performance of the network. So people maybe had terrible internet connections. We found some crazy people trying to run 2,000 nodes on one machine and, and stuff like that, the types of things users do. Um, and that adversely affected the performance. So we're making some fixes there to account for that. And then we'll release uh, nodes running from home. But this technology, much of it exists today. And we're just kind of bringing it all together now. In terms of trying to refer this back then to all the kind of miserable points I made at the start um, and depressed everyone, we believe that the network is, is resilient to many of the, the problems that we have today. I'm not going to say it's going to fix everything. Um, and we'll need to partner with people to fix some of these. But we, we do think it will fix a lot of these problems. In terms of denial of service attacks, uh, data on this network is served from multiple points, multiple nodes, not just one. So there's no single point to target. Uh, the inventor of the, the safe network, David, often says it's like trying to stop this is like trying to poke a hole in the sea. As soon as you poke it in, you're surrounded with water again. And you can think about nodes in the same respect. If a node is taken offline, another one will come in and take its place. And that's true of many decentralized systems. And we have a thing called opportunistic caching, which I'm not going into in much detail. But basically, as data becomes popular in the network, more copies are created. Um, and also, we don't use uh, DNS, so that removes uh, the possibility of denial of service attacks that we spoke to at the start. We've also got a focus on security, as I mentioned. So data is always encrypted. Quite often, we see data stolen from companies, and people rifle through and take credit cards or publish names online and things. If that data was encrypted, they couldn't do anything with it. So encryption is very, very important, obviously. And the data on our network is encrypted client side, which means on the, on the computer. So none of this information exists on the network. So if you enter a password, it doesn't exist on the network. It can't be stolen from the network. Only you know what it is. So it would require someone to come and beat you with a hammer to tell you what your password is. Um, or they could have a key logger. So endpoint security is still an issue. But um, it's client side encrypted. So we don't know the passwords in the network. We don't even know who our users are, where they're based. We don't even know what they're looking at. And we can only make approximations about how many we have on the network, which is a very strange concept when you think about it. A nightmare for marketers. You know, how, how is the company doing? How many users do you have? We generally don't know. Um, but that's the price of security, I would say. Um, we've got built-in privacy and anonymity. Um, so node, node IDs are assigned at random by the network. And IP addresses, so the IP address is like your, your online postcode, if you like. Um, which identifies you, um, that is scrubbed on first hop. So as soon as you come onto the network, we don't know who you are. 
um, scale. Um, it scales very well, um, or will do once it starts to scale. Um, around and so the network is scaling around its users so as people download the software and start running it the network will increase in size and obviously for whatever reason they decide to take it off it will decrease quite a different model when you look at something like google who have to plan about five years in advance for putting a data center in they have to get planning they have to get builders in is there a stream nearby to cool the data centers and then they have to hope that the users come um, and then once they have all that the, the, the horrendous cost kicking this is a network that is using untapped resource, um, or will hopefully be using this untapped resource. Um, and it's also low cost, so we don't know, because the network is still not fully out in the wild, we don't know costs. Logic would suggest to you it should be significantly cheaper than what we have today because it's unused computing resource. And what users are really doing is, is paying for their electricity. In this country, we're fortunate enough to have mostly unlimited um, data on the internet. Countries like America, it's not like that. But for, for us here in a lot of Europe, the cost will be extremely low. And you could even lower it further by having low energy devices. So you can have single board computers like Raspberry Pis, and you can just plug it in, leave it in all the time, and just have it running away in the corner, potentially earning you money, which is an interesting concept. So in conclusion, hopefully I'm kind of running on time, I'm not sure. but. Um, uh, centralized networks can deliver uh, really high performance, but they are prone to attack. And decentralization is, is like I say, is not just um, the domain of MadeSafe. I was going to talk a bit about um, ADEPT, but I'm not going to do that now because Paul Prodi is going to speak about it, and he was uh, one of the creators of it. And I don't want to like, say the wrong thing and screw it up, and he'll tell you about it anyway. So, so that's really, really interesting. But there's, there's big, big companies getting involved in decentralization as well. And for people in, uh, who are aware of Bitcoin, you'll know the massive amount of investment that is going in there now. So there's been over a billion dollars worth of investment. So even forget the stuff like all the financial institutions and banks using it. In actual smaller companies like MadeSafe, we would be kind of termed as a, a blockchain or Bitcoin 2.0 type company. There is a lot of investment going in. There is something here for sure. Whether it's, I hope it's MadeSafe that, that will be one that breaks through. But the reality is it will be hopefully a few of us that will break through um, because these changes definitely require to be made. And I think what we're seeing here, um, just to kind of wrap up, is that the technology that we're seeing is really technology, not just uh, infrastructure, is that we're seeing uh, decentralization is taking hold across all our lives. So if we look at things like education, Udacity and Code Academy and all these sites online were unimaginable a, a few years ago. And even look at things like 3D printing. Everything is, technology is allowing us to become more decentralized. We don't even need to go into the office now to work. We can work at home. As a company, MadeSafe have um, about 18 staff. Um, I was just saying to the guys earlier, 18 months ago, we had 20 of those guys, or 18 of those guys based in Troon. We've now got seven. And the rest are based in India, Brazil, um, uh, Prague, all across the world. And so I think decentralization is really taking hold. and. Uh, technology, I think, is the main driver. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you.